Did you guys get the heat wave too that New York got? Because that was really bonkers. Here has just been rain and then we've had rumblings of our volcano again. So here's to calm and all the weather. Um, and yeah, okay, I will get started so we can get through most of this. Good morning and good evening, folks, wherever you're watching from. So folks, we are gonna be talking, oh, you have a hurricane coming. Okay, so batten down the hatches too. Praying for you guys. I'll make sure to do that when meditating later. But today we will be talking about uh, sport-related hair and skin issues. And this is kind of a, um, a really personal thing for me because as a kid, I really struggled with loving being active when I was younger um, and also having sweat acne. So I would actually be that kid in school who didn't want to wear tank tops and didn't want to wear <laughs> anything that kind of showed my arms or my chest or my back. Hi, Sarge. So, yeah, uh, if any of you are users of Id Gel, you've me to thank. This is, this is really, I was instrumental in sort of having that happen. So as a teen, we already knew that sweat acne was actually caused by a fungus, but we didn't really have an, a targeted way of dealing with it. So my mother would have me slather on dandruff shampoo. And I remember one of the more... Um, impactful or I guess sticky things from my childhood was remembering waking up extra early to go to the bathroom so no one would see me so I put on this blue shampoo all over and I remember really really clearly number one the fear of someone walking in on me looking like a naked smurf and two the burning because if you left and it's true if you leave shampoo on it can burn and I would actually if I left it on too long which you would sometimes do if you're desperate right I would get welts that would then peel off. So all in all, not a great thing. So it gel very much my uh, my BFF since about, I don't know, since I was a kid. So yeah, it's a blue bottle, not blue shampoo anymore, which is awesome. And it's also why to this day, I don't feel clean unless I do a scrubby soap on the body, right? So this is my other kind of go-to. Before we get into that and calling my mom, don't forget to please um, follow us on Instagram like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Let us know where you're calling from, calling from, watching from, and if you have any questions, and we'll make sure to get them, uh, especially if they're VMV related stuff, try to get them in early or when my mom leaves, because when she's here, we really focus on the dermatological stuff. Other things that folks in the house swear by for, for fitness is Boo Boo Bomb. Uh, my husband really swears by it, and one of the more awesome things is like when he does he plays a lot of football he's argentinian so he's big into soccer and stuff and it's really cool sort of watching him and my other friends these big burly guys you know do a hard tackle and then ask for their boo-boo bomb which is really cute <laughs> and um yeah my own kids obviously boo-boo bomb is a big thing they get infections either from you know swimming fungal infections or my daughter who's a big dancer from ballet point shoes she deals sometimes with toe issues, um, which I'm sure a lot of dancers do. So yeah, for those of you prioritizing prioritizing fitness, which we all should be doing anyway, and we'll get into that a little bit more later, some standards definitely to have Essence Superwash hair and body um, for hair and body cleansing, because when we sweat, we do, you know, it can clog pores and cause problems. So acne here, here on the upper back, um, cheeks, that sort of thing. Definitely look at your hair care. And any of our cleansers, always a thing. I personally like a scrub after I work out. And Id Monolorin Gel, I already mentioned, Boo Boo Bomb, and of course, Armada Sport. In the United States, we have the Stay On Point, which is the, the thicker barrier cream. We don't have Armada Sport in the States right now. But um, yeah, you can shop our clinically validated hypoallergenic uh, products, clinically published, validated hypoallergenic products on vmvhypoallergenics.com internationally and vmvhypoallergenics.ph in the Philippines. And um, in the Philippines, we're also on Viber, so you can find us there. You can PM us your patch test results and we can customize recommendations for you. In the USA, we're just focused on getting stocks to you guys. So believe me when I say we're not sleeping and all we're doing is trying to get stocks to you 
in the Philippines, we do have a, a bundle that is um, pretty cool. It is the I Get My Do pouch, which is this guy, with a full size of the Re Everything face and body lotion, a travel size of the oil free moisturizer. I didn't have a travel size, but it's a travel size that's in here, and a travel size of the Boo Boo Bomb tube. So that's ongoing now. Um, and we just launched a home patch test service. So you can ask us about that at the end of the live stream today. So make sure to ask your questions. We'll be giving away two of these cool pouches, um, Armada Sport pouches, to those, I believe, who RSVP'd and make comments. And um, a lot of people have been interested in purchasing my mom's book, Rx Coconuts, one of her two books. Um, she has all these other published studies, but her book, Rx Coconuts, is still available. So PM us if you're interested in that. And if you'd like a teleconsultation with her or any other doctor that we work with, drop us a PM as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. On that note, I will get to calling in my mother, Dr. Viralia Rowell, who is our founding dermatopathologist, um, to talk to us more about skin and fitness and hair and sport-related issues. Hi. Hello there. Come on in. I wanted to try to walk like a sports person, you know. Oh. <laughs> you certainly do that. Hello. Mwah. Another one. Mwah. So, Hi. okay, so you all, I mean, for those who are regular viewers, you all know my mom already, but for those who are maybe joining us for the first time, in addition to being a hardcore researcher and multi, multi-published clinician and teacher, my mom does see some of the m most complex cases, hospitalized cases and whatnot. But what I think is interesting is every consultation with her includes an interview about health. How are you, you know, what are you eating? How are you sleeping? Are you managing your stress? And are you keeping fit? So this is actually a great, I think, opportunity to really right. talk about why that's important. Uh -huh. um, and that you don't have to choose between clear skin and getting fit, right? So say hi to everyone, Mom. Hello, everybody, <laughs> wherever you are. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so why is fitness so important for skin? Because fitness is um, associated with circulation of the blood, among other mm -hmm. things. Um, it also affects the functioning of the various organs in the body, thyroid, pancreas, whatever, or a kidney, to make them function well, because there is circulation going on as well. Your heart is pumping well, your blood pressure is maintained. So this is why the skin is, um, the fitness issue is important. Also, I believe you now know that uh, inflammation is the primary mover of many diseases that are yeah. currently plaguing man, whether it's hypertension or heart disease or diabetes or uh, depression or... Uh, yeah, inflammation yeah. is the thing. The, it's the, just the, the thing. primary problem is inflammation there. Yeah. And it's really not the gene. The gene is the, 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 its function is basically to respond to what we are feeding into the body and that includes exercise. So let's talk about that some okay. more. So, uh, well, here, here's the thing, right? I think a lot of people who have skin issues get, how do I say this? A lot, of, fitness is hard enough, right, for a lot of us. I mean, if you're blessed with the gene that makes you wanna work out, fabulous, good for you. But I do think that's a rarity, and I think a lot of us struggle with wanting to work out every single day, just because it's hard to make the time for it. It's unpleasant, it's whatever. And I think skin problems, add another degree of difficulty to being good about working out, right? Mm -hmm. So there are common issues, there are fungal infections, there's acne and there's stuff like that. But before getting into that, maybe we can touch just very briefly on what should people be doing? What are the studies saying now that people should be doing in terms of fitness? Because before it was just three times a week of right. very, very intense right. working out, right? right? But that's changed. right? Yeah. Basically, what people are now talking about is that there should be regularity. And so, basically, what I tell habit, you know, talking about habit, there are great books about the power of habit, you know. So, my, what I tell my patients, and remember, my patients can be the very severely inflamed, joint pain, painful, psoriasis patients, have a hard time even just getting up, you know, and have actual pain and all of that. And what I tell them 
is, because I want them to exercise every day. So the best time to exercise is actually when you wake up in the morning. Mm. And if you make that a habit, the habit repeats itself, wants to do it every day. And so I, I start with saying, start at 10 minutes, if you will, going up and down a step, you know, get a, a, you know, something that looks like a stair and just go up and down. And then the following day, do it more, do it 15 minutes. And then slowly, you can build up to 30 minutes and then about an hour of doing cardio together with some weights and all of that. Yeah. Or you can do walking exercise, but do it on a regular basis, not this three times a week or two Tuesday and Friday or something like that. It's bound to become not yeah. so much a habit. Well, what they're saying now, I read a new study out of the Mayo Clinic, is regularity trumps intensity all the time. So it's better to do 30 minutes of even relatively mild activity every single day, seven days a week, mm -hmm. than to do high intensity craziness three times a week, mm -hmm. right? So if your choice is spinning three times a week versus walking every day, the walking every day is probably better for you. If you get to the point where you can do both, then fantastic, even better, right? But it mm -hmm. is important. There are many studies also which mm -hmm. show that if you do excessive exercise, by the way, you know, you decide this weekend I'm really going to do it, and so you do a half day of walking, running, or whatever, and then the rest of the week, you're not really. Mm. That excessive exercise may actually fl uh, trigger an inflammation in the right. body, right. right? So it's better to so, do something every day. Yeah. So very quickly, we have some good questions already, <laughs> which is in, which is wonderful. I'm so happy about the antiperspirant feedback. Okay, so maybe top concerns that we see with mm -hmm. skin, I know acne is going to be there, Yes, right? right? Fungal infections, but also warts, surprisingly enough. So maybe we go through the, the Let's weirder do the acne one. first. Ah, okay, acne first. Okay. okay. Acne is not really acne in, in most cases. Of course, mm -hmm. if you really have acne, which is really a sterile postule, you know, it forms, it clogs and produces these little micro vesicles and then into postules. Those are basically, in acne, they really are basically sterile except maybe for some, what we call commensal. Acne is basically sterile? Except for oh, okay. the commensal <laughs> organisms that are normally present, and they're just, they're not invaders. Mm -hmm. They're really just there, so they're called pterosporum organisms, now called malassezia, and uh, you know, there are even mites that are normal in the skin, and so they exist yeah. in these uh, acne. But they're not postules the way you think about a boil or you know an infection like s infected by staph or strep or some organism like that. On the other hand, what we call sweat acne, right. which is the clogging of the pores by the perspiration and maybe some peeling of the skin or whatever, those are not acne in a sense. They are really clogging of the sweat pores and then the formation of the coming in of that organism I was telling you about, which lives Malaysia. normally the malassezia normally in around a hair follicle, sebaceous gland. They then infect it and produce what we call sweat folliculitis, which is due to the malassezia, and therefore you have a folliculitis, not an acne. Yeah. Okay, but you can have, okay, what's interesting to me about what you just said there is you can actually have three acne-like things to deal with. Mm -hmm. The first being acne, acne, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you produce a lot of sweat, mm -hmm. maybe a lot your of sebum. Your androgens are growing up, you're a teenager, right. you have some endocrine problems that right. increase the steroids and all of that. So, so that's acne, acne. acne. Right, is helped by non-comedogenic stuff, maybe an anti-acne medication or skincare or treatment, mm -hmm. right? She did mention something else in passing, and I'm not sure if you guys caught that, but it is also possible to have real infections like a boil mm -hmm. or like a staph infected lesion. So if something looks like a really big cyst, something very infected, don't dismiss it as just acne, mm -hmm. because there could be a bacteria there a that's bacteria bad. A bacteria that's really important there. And the reason that that sometimes tends to happen with people who work out a lot mm -hmm. is because, especially if you're hardcore, right? There's a lot of pro-inflammatory things going on in your body, which can sometimes, if it's too much, weaken the immune system. Mm -hmm. But also if you go to the gym, and Think about the things stuff. that you touch. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So that can be a risk as well. Mm -hmm. But the, the common one that we tend to see is this sweat folliculitis. Sweat acne Very is really common. a misnomer, right? Yeah. So sweat folliculitis, which is caused by the malassezia fungus. Mm -hmm. For that, you need an antifungal, right. not so much an antibacterial. Mm 
mm -hmm. right? Right. So that, yeah. So there's a fourth one, by the way. Oh, what? The folliculitis from applying too many antiseptics on your skin. Okay, there you go. If you're that kind, you know, you're I, a fellow, a real good friend of mine who likes to putter around in his beautiful island somewhere there, sends me pictures of his back or his front with tiny little folliculitis types of spots. And it turns out that he's really in the process of continually using and cleaning up the house and, you know, spraying and all of that. So he said, when you quit that, and what he did was he used uh, a vinegar. And he said, it works well. I said, yeah, of course, because the organisms are killed by the, the vinegar in a very natural way. It's just the pH adjustment by the vinegar instead of being using a chemical like those sprays that you like right. to use. So, so there's a bit of a balance here, folks. If you, if you do go to the gym or, and you, know, you want to be better, you want to avoid those hardcore community-acquired infections, mm -hmm. if you over-sterilize and over-disinfect, then the risk is now you might get a, a folliculitis from the natural organisms in your skin that you're also killing off by mm -hmm. hyper disinfecting. So for stuff like that, you might want to look at more natural alternatives like vinegar or virgin coconut oil right. or monolaurin, right. right? Okay. And the fifth possible cause is if you're using steroids all the time. So bottom line, go see a doc, your dermatologist. If you really have recurring problem with acne-like things and you just think it's just acne, then go, go see a specialist, go to dermatologist and ask, is, what is this? What, why does it keep coming back, right? In spite of the fact that I'm applying steroids or the antiseptics that they say is good. Okay, I have a first question we can maybe get to is from Leah. If in case I get sunburn due to prolonged outdoor activity, what's first aid? Um, for that, I would place cold compress immediately. And if you can get cold coconut oil that's from the refrigerator and compress it, it's fantastic. It really brings down the inflammation very quickly. And because that coconut oil has occlusive and humectant properties, it helps in keeping the water that is innate in that barrier layer in rather than being dehydrated out because you've lost your barrier from the burn, right? And um, an anti-inflammatory balm mm -hmm. with like potassium azyl oil diglycinate with monolaurin, with virgin coconut oil can really bring that down. Mm -hmm. Also, I've heard you say if you're not allergic, you can take an anti-inflammatory. Absolutely. Right, like yeah. ibuprofen. Right. So but take two As long ibuprofen. as you're not allergic to it. Yeah. But take an anti-inflammatory. Okay. The other thing that you do is, okay, you've got a burn, and you look at it, and you, it looks like it's going to blister. Immediately address that. Get the cold compress I was telling you about. Compress it well with pressure. And then get a wrap, actually. You, know, you can get a white cotton material. Don't use rubberized or elasticized. Just put it on thickly. Make it a, 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 like, a, like a pressure dressing. And wrap it. And that will allow that skin to not become more blistered. As a matter of fact, it flattens and it behaves itself. It doesn't become more more inflamed. These are nice little first aid things that you can do to burns when you're out there in the sun and all of a sudden you forgot the time or, you know, do that. And that Be Better, of course, to avoid the burn yes. to begin <laughs> with, if you can. Sometimes all of us, accidents happen or whatever happens, right? But mm -hmm. if you can prevent it, that's better. So in terms of sunscreen being outdoors, um, you really need to think about reapplying every hour or two particularly if you're like golfing, running, Perspiring, swimming, yeah, yes. really outdoors Getting for in a and long out of the water. time. Um, what advice to put on those, this is from Sarge, who have extremely dry skin after long hours of training or swimming and after a long day at the beach? Right. Is VCO okay or do we pair it with something else? I pair it with petroleum jelly, the Vasil with a pure 100% Vas Alba or petroleum jelly. Why? Because first the coconut oil does the things that it does about repairing of the skin and being both an occlusive and a humectant so that it protects that barrier, right? Uh, basically what the dry skin is from is because you have already destroyed the barrier from either the chlorine or whatever other chemicals are in the swimming pool or if you've been in and out of the, even the Actually, the water from the sea is much better because it's got salt that's very nice, moisturizing. But if you get burnt or you get subliminal burns there, then you'll also endanger that, um, that um, 
higher layer of the mm-hmm. skin and again you have dry skin the dryness is all whether it's from the chlorine or other chemicals or whether it's from too much exposure to the sun or too much exposure to other kind of pollutants in the uh, resort that perhaps that you're at the the main thing for the dryness is really just the barrier layer has now become compromised and so therefore you have to protect it and so by putting the coconut oil which supplies fatty acids to help repair the uh, lipid membranes of those cells it also is an occlusive and a humectant so it's got glycerol glycerol for instance which contributes to it's a great strong absorber of water mm-hmm. so it can absorb it from inside your body and at the same time it retains it so it stays in the skin in addition to that if immediately after you've been in the pool you rinse off don't soap yourself because the soap will only uh, contribute to more barrier compromising then you therefore apply the oil and then the petroleum jelly the petroleum jelly is basically an occlusive so in mm-hmm. other words it will cement basically or occlude the thing that you had put on the coconut oil perfect do that all the time right. and you will notice your skin becoming less it should also help with fungal infections associated with swimming no that can tend to happen yes you oh. know my son had that <laughs> <laughs> there's something actually i wanted to ask about swimming is it really is it a good idea to wear a hair like a what do you call it the swimming cap to protect your hair from the chlorine for example yes depends upon what kind of hair that you have if you for instance have like people i know who need to really treat their hair or peroxide it or you know bleach it i mean so that, in other words a lot of chemicals have been used to curl it straighten it uh, you know um uh, hair dry it every day or whatever so that's hair that is basically already compromised mm. and if you're going to be in the sun for a good period of time yes uh, not being too sun exposed would be very good for the hair. You, you might be, it might be a good idea for you to put something uh, around it. But just remember that many of them are rubberized. Yeah, so if you're allergic to rubber, that could be an issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out there is we talked in a previous live stream about traction alopecia, which is if you keep putting your hair back in a ponytail, uh, or, or it's also called ballerina baldness, right, for a reason. <laughs> yes. um, then that can cause or contribute to hair loss. So if you're using a swimming cap regularly, you might want to think about the pull mm-hmm. on your hair strands. Yeah. Um, if you're concerned about hair loss or if, if you've noticed a little bit of hair loss, something else that someone shared with me was before she goes in the water, she doesn't use a cap, she actually puts conditioner on her hair first. Good idea. Right? Mm-hmm. And VCO or, or petrolatum, I guess it would depend on the pool <laughs> if they would allow that, um, but it's a good barrier for when you go in the water. You could put the coconut oil and then the uh, petroleum jelly. You can put zinc oxide paste, and I mean it's really messy, but it's protecting your hair. Um, okay, we have a nice question here that I know a lot of people suffer from. Jennifer is asking, what's a good solution to reduce or minimize chafing? and also to address the skin discoloration that comes from chasing, uh, chafing. <laughs> okay, Pre- chafing I presume is either from the shoes or from what you're wearing. If or you're running a marathon too, or from the right? genitals. So there's, there's a lot of rubbing. Right. Or from your, I get it from my, my sports bra, in between the legs from running. I know that cyclists also have it. It's basically constant friction of mm-hmm. you know, clothing or, or skin against skin. Put oil. Mm. prior to the the effort prior to the activity right. put oil reapply it if you wish that because that will give it slip instead of chafe slip and then reapply it as needed and then immediately after you do the exercise and you see this red chafed uh, area again put the oil and the petroleum jelly for me, those two together are Even fantastic. more than like a zinc oxide paste. The zinc oxide, dioxide yeah. paste. The zinc oxide paste is fantastic for protection against the sun itself. But not for chafing? Light. Not so much because as long as it's not high in concentration, the 40% is okay. I use 40% zinc oxide. When you get up to 60%, it can, becomes a little bit uh, grainy mm-hmm. and uh, you know, it's it may not be so. But good. I guess I guess where I'm trying to come from is, if I am understanding you correctly, the chafing happens because you have two things, 
you know, friction, right? It's irritation from friction, two things that are rubbing against each other like this for a long time. If, if I'm following her logic correctly, if you put something there that helps reduce the friction, it's like adding WD-40 <laughs> to a door to prevent squeaking, right? Or, or to, to open sliding to glass doors. You want there to be more slide, so you reduce the friction of the contact. So putting VCO and petrolatum, yeah, could be a good thing. And that won't cause like bumps or acne like type lesions. Not at all. Coconut Very oil good. is not bumpy. It's that's not, that's, bumpy. That's it's that's not comedogenic. I have some sure. beautiful pictures, but you'd hate it. Uh, you'd, uh, because <laughs> some uh, very good examples is uh, are big, flabby, heavy people who are just sitting in bed and don't move. And boy, their bottoms and their in their thighs become really irritable. It's not chafing in the way you think of just those uh, um, t tissues right beside each other and hardly moving this time. Mm. By just applying the coconut oil and the petroleum jelly in between, you should see, I had a patient in two weeks of just doing that after suffering from it for quite a while in a hospital, um, he, he was just so thankful that his skin felt so much better. So just as simple a thing as that, just putting a layer of the film of this oil to slick it, to make it a... To get the glide going, basically. <laughs> to get the glide. So she, her follow-up question to that was discoloration that comes from chafing, the how to deal with yeah, that. Yeah, the discoloration is because of the inflammation. Yeah. So it's post-inflammatory mm -hmm. hyperpigmentation. Yeah. And then the inflammation can be either from the pigment, the melanin, that is either newly formed because of the inflammation or just increased because also of the inflammation, the oxidative processes and all of that in an inflammatory process. Or it can be because you may have hemorrhage. You may have had, you may, I don't know, you may be taking some medicine that's making you hemorrhage quickly or Sometimes when you take many of these antioxidants, mm. you know, you become you become prone to bleeding easily as well. Actually, turmeric. Turmeric is uh, a phenomenal antioxidant, yeah. anti-inflammatory, but it is an anticoagulant or at least a thinner. Yeah, many of them are so, thinners. Yeah. So if you're taking too many of them, you may bleed easily and therefore you can have also from the heme, from the hemoglobin, you can have that. So be sure that you're looking into the vitamins that you're also taking. Don't over. Yeah. My message is always, you know, the balance, vitamins balance, balance. are used by the body in balance with the pro-oxidants, pro and anti. So don't over overdo your vitamins. Yeah. Okay. Eat, eat it rather than... We have some <laughs> questions here from Instagram as well. Stacy was asking, um, what can work for athlete's foot? Okay. Athlete's foot can be from the simple thing of being too tight. What is athlete's foot? Athlete's foot is um, basically when they tell me that they have athlete's foot, they usually mean there's already an infection. Okay. Okay. So I can start with the athlete's foot from too much chafing because you're wearing your, your shoes are already too tight or you're wearing very thick socks. So always wear a pair of shoes that are about one and a half to two sizes bigger than your normal. That will allow you to have a uh, distance from the, you know, from the box and uh, therefore and a little bit of breathing space so that's mm -hmm. one and then even if you do that uh, I was looking at somebody's nail actually of a 90 year old lady who still does walking and walking and walking and the nail has now become very thick on one foot on the nail there and it is skewed that way many people most of us really are um, asymmetric in that one part of the body is a little bit bigger than the others you look yourself up and you'll know what I mean. Breast-wise, for instance, and others. And this lady, you could see that her foot on the right is a little bit bigger than the left. And so therefore, wearing that same sh size shoe for both, she was actually bending this mm. to the right. And you could see that because the foot, the toe here, had a, had a thickened area, you know. So examine always yourself body-wise before you decide on the pair of shoes you're going to be wearing. That's one. Once you have now then damaged the toenail or the skin has chafed enough so that organisms can get go into it either from barefoot in the, in the shower, when you're taking a shower after you've done your exercises, you can get bugs from there. Mm -hmm. Or um, you're sweating a lot and then after you sweat, instead of putting your 
pair of shoes in an area that it can dry up properly or actually washing it depending upon how how sweaty your uh, uh, your feet have become you have to alternate shoes to be sure that they are dried up I oops I tell patients for instance you know if it's winter for instance and you don't have any you can always put it behind the refrigerator there's a warm area there that can dry it up quicker Ugh. but it should be dried up uh, in order for you not to get fungi and okay, bacteria from wait. there. Wait, <laughs> I want to back up a bit because I think what's happening here is athlete's foot is not a medical term. So when people see her and say they have athlete's foot, there's a bit of a range right. Right, that it could be. But before that, thank you, Walrus, who says, good day to these two amazing ladies. Thank you so much for all the skincare tips you're sharing for free today. You don't understand. This has made my day. I've been a little worried here because so many people are having problems with their video and I don't know what to do. So I am stressed and that just gave me life. So thank you. Relax. Okay. So yes, yeah, so going back to the, the foot, athlete's foot issue. When you say you have athlete's foot, she tends to see a range of things. Mm -hmm. True athlete's foot, the way I grew up being taught about it, is a fungal infection. Um, because of this moist, sweaty environment. With you mean the on the soles and not the nails? Well, that's the thing, right? Everyone who says, I have athlete's foot, can be anything from an, an infection, like what she was talking about, where the shoes are too tight, or there has been chafing, or there's been some other break in the barrier so that a critter has gotten in and caused an infection. That could be a bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. If it is a fungal thing, sorry, <laughs> if it's a fungal thing, it might be because of the moist environment of the area being welcoming for this growth, right, mm -hmm. of fungus. But I also know people who get warts in their feet. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, the ones I know, the warts are so stubborn because they're hardcore triathletes. And these are sometimes women who stop getting their periods or people who are such hardcore, either CrossFit or triathlete type people. Um, and they really have problems with their immune system. So I know you've had to deal with I've some had to deal with patients really like that. resistant warts. Yeah, I had a very famous uh, sportsman who came to me one day because he said, I get continually these rashes and people have been telling me this is due to a fungus. And I can't imagine why I have, I'm very fit, I exercise, et cetera. And it turned out that he was turning, he was going to be asked to be a model. And mm. uh, so he decided to, you know, do more exercises because <laughs> he would really 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 look fit and he looked fit already to start with but he said he went and so i examined him and everything else and they were right the diagnosis was correct but then the question is why and uh, so that's when i said let me look in the literature because this was several years ago and i found out that in fact the uh, immune system can become derailed by too much exercise. So therefore I did what we call, you know, tested him for his T cells, CD4, CD8, and all of that. And he was immunocompromised. There was a reversal. So I told him about that. We simmered down a little and all that. <laughs> One month later he comes back and says, I'm perfect. Right. So these are so some yes. things to consider. Don't self diagnose if you see funky things happening with your mm -hmm. feet. Um, yeah, don't because it could be bacteria, it could be fungus, it could be a wart, which is viral. Yes, yeah. Yes. So yeah, you need to see somebody. Uh, Gian is asking, I play badminton and tend to get calluses on my feet. Is there a good way to prevent this? Great shoes. question. Look at your shoes again. Where are the calluses? Are in the right foot or the left foot? Mm. On what part of the foot is it? Is it at the, you know, that thing there or is it near a bone? So or let's is it start with heel? why do calluses form? From, from friction. So usually calluses will start, not always, but, but usually they'll start with the a heel. blister, yeah. right? And then you do that enough times and you'll get, a like callus. when I was playing tennis a lot, right? This mm -hmm. is the blisters would start here and then eventually it would get really calloused. Mm -hmm. So there is a point of friction mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed and that could be with the shoes. Do you think VCO could help there as well? Absolutely. Just to provide some glide? Yeah. yeah. The thing about shoes though that's a little funky is if, if you get shoes that are a little too big or if there's too much glide, that can also cause yes, blisters. That right? can also so, produce the glide. So yeah. proper fitting really is important. It's such a big thing. The beauty about uh, the yeah. buying, uh, being able to buy and return, buy and return, buy on the net nowadays is that you can do that. You know, uh, when I was in high school and I was on 
varsity volleyball, I, I had almost broken my ankle. I really sprained it badly. And what they did, which they do still now, is they wrapped it extremely tight so there was no movement. This is the, the one. The plus side of that, and this is what I used to do with tennis as well, is I would get a brace that would increase the size of my, my footprint inside the shoe so there would be no movement inside the shoe. If calluses are really becoming an issue, that might be something to consider. Tell them about the burn you got from the your boyfriend's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she was in high school. Yeah, so rebel without a clue. I was um, riding on the back of my then boyfriend's bike. <laughs> and this is not even related to sports, but it I guess if you're a professional. Okay, fine. So I came off and my, my calf touched the muffler. And because it was so tall, I couldn't get it out right away. So I had a really bad third degree burn with blistering and whatever. At the time, back in the day, blisters were treated by leaving them open mm -hmm. and you let them crust over and whatever. She had been reading about moist wound healing and occlusion dressings. So she basically wrapped it really, really tight to prevent the overproduction of scar tissue and also to allow that tissue to heal in this moist, closed environment. And I am colloidal and I have zero scars. So thank you very much, Mom, for <laughs> taking care of me. This is the back of her leg, which is you know, very important to a lady. <laughs> I just, we won't even talk about that. Okay, so Anne is asking, my dad is super sweaty, even in his hands. Is that normal? Is there an antiperspirant for hands and feet? It makes him very conscious. Hi oh, yeah. Welcome to hyperhidrosis. <laughs> yes, indeedy. Yes, indeed. Oh, Anne, I have that a little bit. My, not so bad. There are some patients she has who really drip, right? But I have it here. I had it in my underarms. Um, go ahead, and I'll, I'll so jump I give in. them the antiperspirant that we use for the axillary area. Tell them to use that same antiperspirant overnight. So they apply it just before they go to sleep at night when they really are no longer sweaty because their bed, bed is beckoning, and uh, they put that on. So there's no sweat to drive away that antiperspirant. Overnight, the following morning, if they're really very sweaty, I tell them to reapply it. You'd be surprised how much less the perspiration is from the palms and soles. And if even that doesn't control it, we actually inject Botox into this. And it's amazing. You know, at the beginning, we tell them to come back after so many months. Amazingly, after it's been done twice mm. or so, it no longer, it's almost like the sweat duck says, oh, okay, I surrender. Yeah. I mean, Don't I'll, do that again. Do that. I'll stop now. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, Botox God. injections are great. So in my personal experience, I actually did a video on this particular issue, hyperhidrosis, excessive sweating, and bromhidrosis, which mm. can come with it, which is the, the foul odor that comes with it. So on my end, thankfully, I was mostly hyperhidrosis, which means... I would really sweat, like dripping, dripping, even in the cold. I don't like to sit after she sat on a chair. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not sure we needed to go there, but there you go. That is true. <laughs> Sorry about after that. After I'm sitting on a chair, you know, I really try to like put a, a barrier between me and the chair. My clothing, what uh, I destroyed so many shirts. And when I would go shopping, I tried to bring like something wet with me just so I could check and see if, if, the, if the fabric would show. Um, Antiperspirant you can totally use on palms and the soles of the feet. In addition, though, Botoxing. Botoxing really in the great. armpits is really, really good. I don't care what the doctor says. The topical anesthesia is not enough. Ask for icing. <laughs> I don't care what the dermatologist says. Put ice first before the injections because these are nerve endings and they really hurt. Um, but very, very effective. So, yes, that can work. Um, Especially okay. if people, uh, I've done this a number of times to so people who say, my work entails me shaking hands know, really... with people. And yeah. I cannot anymore I'd tolerate that having sweaty hands. To I say mean, hello. I couldn't stand it and I couldn't stand anyone touching my feet. And, you know, you don't get your feet touched all that often. I get it, but it was a thing. So I understand the feeling self-conscious. Please tell your dad so many options and certainly PMS if you want to know, but check out that video because I really go through the stuff you can do. Tammy, flare of rosacea, this is a super fantastic question. After being in the sun for about three hours, I did have sunscreen, but she's newly diagnosed with rosacea. So she's still learning her triggers and she's a daily swimmer. She had a recent eye appointment. What are the symptoms of ocular rosacea okay. and how is that controlled? Okay. Um, ocular Great rosacea, question. just like on the skin, 
the vessels in the skin as well as in ocular rosacea over time become dilated. And the reason for this is that it's a genetic, it's an inherited trait of the blood vessels over time. And so it usually starts beyond the age of 30 and then 40 it becomes more manifest. So therefore, that's what you expect. And of course, the eyes become reddish without even any particular stimulation, as mm -hmm. you notice. And of course, whenever there is exposure to the sun, because uh, the rosacea blood vessels are very aggravated by sun exposure. So the most important thing is to wear the glasses, dark glasses, even indoors, because if you're, if you're using the computer a lot, you know there's the blue, blue light there, and the blue light can also stimulate rosacea. As you go into the latter part, into the red light, it's not as bad. So there are people now who suggest wearing of a screen so that uh, what you're seeing is orange light, kind of. It, I work, I use that because I, I use the computer so many hours in a day, and it seems to help my eyes. So that's one suggestion. So other than ocular rosacea, you should look also into the other parts of the of the face. She was actually asking, can rosacea be triggered or flared up by dry air or mouth breathing? Dry air or mouth breathing. Dry air, would you would have less humidity, less water in the air. So um, it would make the eye relatively dry, and so that might trigger the inflammation mm. of the, the dilation of the blood vessels, definitely. I was just thinking of something else that was relevant to this, yes. In, if the diagnosis of ocular rosacea was made, please also consider the possibility of you becoming sensitive to the mm. chemicals that are being used as eye drops, because a ah, number yes. of them have uh, preservatives in particular. In the old days, it was a lot of the iodine-based, and people were allergic to iodine uh, as a preservative in those things. And then it might be the antibiotic as well, because many times they place antibiotics. And many times there's a steroid uh, added on to these eye drops yeah. that by themselves, steroids, when we do a PATS test, we include steroids, by the way. The steroids themselves can be allergens, either because of the chemical itself or, again, because of the preservatives that are added to these chemicals. So just be sure, the best thing is if it's a, um, um, humectant that is needed to the eyes. for the eyes. Get the ones that are come that come in ampules. You mm. open it and uh, because those single have no preservatives. Sing, single use stuff. Right. Uh, they so have no preservatives. We tried hydrogen peroxide ones, pure hydrogen peroxide that had no preservatives. But it's extremely irritating <laughs> after a while. So yeah. there's that as well. Like iodine actually is not an allergen, believe it or not. It is a halogen that is an irritant. She and I are going to fight about this again later, but I'll prove it to her. Um, because we did research on that for allergen, not an allergen. But yeah, that's, I think, some great advice. Thank you for asking that, uh, Tammy. That's awesome. Jennifer is asking, are there little known good skin practices? By the way, my daughter has just come Hi. from cleaning up my leather, so yes. yay for her. And also, and that explains sorry. the t-shirt. <laughs> okay, it was a school thing. Yeah, little known good skin practices we should be observing before, during, or after a workout besides sunscreen. I can take this a little bit. Mm -hmm. So um, don't work out with makeup on. No. That's a thing. Bad you don't idea. need more stuff on your skin. I know a lot of people who do. I know, but really don't. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll share with you a really fantastic story that I think is quite rare, but just in case it helps someone out there. When I was younger and obsessed, like I really wanted to get fit and lose weight and, and train hard and whatever, what I stupidly did once <laughs> was I wore those sauna pants. Hello, the 80s. This really dates me. There were sauna pants that were extremely hot because, hello, you're supposed to feel like a sauna. And I would wear that um, while playing tennis. And so what happened is I developed this crazy folliculitis, this acne all over my, no, no. What happened, something else happened and she gave me a steroid that I then applied all over my legs because my skin was going crazy. And then I developed a crazy steroidal acne all over my legs. So be a little careful about the amount of occlusion, the amount of stuff that you use, either clothing or gear or makeup that makes it like an oven <laughs> on your skin. You don't want that. You want circulation. Mm -hmm. Also remember what we said about the shoes 
and about some of the, the issues with fungus and warts. Mm. All of these things like really warm, moist environments. So we want air circulation <laughs> as much as possible. So clothing, yeah. shower, all very important. Exactly. Air protectant, you know, before you begin. <laughs> Tammy says Merry Christmas. That's hilarious. <laughs> Thank you. It was a school thing. Uh, <laughs> and then also, yes, like if you come out after a pool in particular, then you do want to hit the showers. You want to get rid of that mm. chlorine. You don't want that chlorine sitting on you. Uh, coming from a gym, make sure to use like monolaurin just to, to deal with bugs that you might be picking up. I want to make sure I get to Anne. Yes, they say if you have a cut because it's 1051. It's, they say if you have a cut, it's okay to swim because the chlorine or salt water will dry it up. Uh, it depends upon whether you're keloidal okay. or you tend to have hyperpigmentation or whatever. If you have a cut, the best thing to deal with that cut is really disinfect it already. You don't wait for the chlorine to disinfect it. Disinfect it with an antibiotic you like, or for me, just coconut oil and the monolaurin ointment is terrific. Put it there, wrap it up well, you know, and then what you can do if you're just going into the swimming pool is you wrap it up tight so that it is occluded, like we were talking mm. about earlier. Then you can get a tube of plastic and just put it there, tie the bottom, tie the top, and there you got so, the protection for that wound. Right. You can go in the pool. But then I think the question, specifically to Anne's question, is to yes, to yes, it can get infected. So the chlorine in pool water and the salt in ocean water is not a guarantee that a cut or a wound will not get infected because there's other stuff in there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In a pool, especially a public pool or in the ocean, there's other stuff in there that can get into the cut. So it's better, if I heard you correctly, it's better to cover up the cut. Yeah, and remember, it. you have a cut and there are chemicals in that pool. Mm. You know, not, not, we're not talking about the organisms because you're talking about the question is on organisms, it'll take care of infection, perhaps. Mm. But think about the muriatic acid and the chlorine and whatever other chemicals. But in the ocean, you don't have that. Yes, but you have other things like from the bugs of the ocean. That's see? So yeah, so no, it's not, it's not that if I have an open wound or a cut that swimming in pool water or the ocean will cure it. That you actually need to protect very it. Painful. So you have also. the cystosoma, you have the also. mycobacteria, you have several other bugs that other are there. Other critters to to uh, to look out for. Sarge is asking, skincare and sports, is there any truth to the salt water as being a good remedy for prickly heat or oh. too much sweating for hyperactive individuals? Salt water being a good remedy for prickly heat. Prickly, prickly heat. heat is... Well, the, the salt water... Yeah. The water alone cools you in the swimming uh, in the uh, in the ocean, right? But regarding this, prickly heat is um, over stimulation of the sweat glands, so that they're really open and perspiring. And then it's with itchy, that, it then right? gets clogged up for one reason or other. Perhaps the sunscreen you're using, or an oil that you're applying that is occlusive, and all of that, and so it then closes up. And once that closes up, the sweat duct then becomes inflamed. And when that uh, becomes inflamed backwards, you now have a duct that is That's what you that's call- That's a technical term. They have <laughs> duct-like spots that become itchy, become inflamed, you know. That's called, this is what we're talking about. Is it prickly heat? Well, that's the thing. Prickly heat's like one of those, like like athlete's foot. It can kind of be several, several different things, right? So, um, does salt water help? Probably not, honestly. Um, it may for a short <laughs> while now because yeah. it, the, the the salt will re help remove that uh, top layer it that depends, is clogging. Depends if it's really prickly heat. There is yeah. what I'm saying. I did a we did a, a ask us intellectual video where we actually talk about prickly heat as well sort of how to um, identify it and what to do. I'm gonna answer this one last question with her here and then she has to go um, because it's important. Leah's asking, does reapplying sunblock apply to lips as well? Mm -hmm. Should you also reapply on the lips? Yes. Yes, very thin skinned area. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll make sure that at least we get, yes, okay. On that note, I will let her go. I will go with her. Oh, okay. Oh, Everyone's yeah. abandoning me at once. And then I have, <laughs> you stay here because I need help. Okay. I love you. I love Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. I love you. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Uh, bye and bye. Let us know what else. We're running Take out of care. live stream Enjoy topics. summer. <laughs> we can do we another are. open forum, but we'd love to know what well. you would like to know and also what works. Maybe we'll go to like once a month now that things are opening up over here. But what I wanted to make sure was um, remind folks. Wait, we also have to pick winners Ooh. <laughs> for today. Um, yes, but sort of on that note, as a reminder of stuff that's happening in the Philippines, you can find us on Viber, you can find the clinic on Viber. We still do teleconsultations, we do an at-home patch test. Now, uh, do you know what Gavin's favorite part is to do? Remember to... Uh, like, subscribe, uh, put, uh, click the notification bell, and share if you like this. Yes, there you go. Um, and yeah, so remember we have all these other specials that are happening online, but first and foremost, the winner today of our Armada sort of sport pouch are Sarge, Angela Manalo, and Laudi and Gian Taplacido. So Ooh, congratulations. Congrats. And thank you again for watching, guys, and we'll see you next week. Please let us know again if there's anything that you would like us to cover. Um, if not, with things opening up and, and my mom in particular getting busier, with patients and studies and stuff. We might be adjusting our schedule to be a little less frequent, but mm -hmm. let us know uh, what you, would be helpful for you and what you'd like to you'd like us to cover. I love the earrings I always have. Thank you. <laughs> All right, folks. Have a great weekend. Be bye. safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.